Alex De Pledge is one of the UK's most impressive female entrepreneurs. She founded and exited the cleaning company Hassel, and now her new venture is looking at home improvements and how we make them more streamlined and simple for people to be able to do. We've all been spending more time at home because of the pandemic, and so therefore home improvements and renovations are on the rise. But it's a tricky topic if you've never done it before. You don't know the right questions to ask. You don't know the things that are available to you. And that's exactly what Resi does. It allows people to see what their home could be. We also delve into many other topics, such as how to make that process more environmentally friendly. And we also look at what the new government can do to be supporting entrepreneurs. Alex, welcome back to Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Thanks for having me back, Jimmy. (laughs) Now, one of the first questions that we've started asking since you were on the show is, what's in a name? Where did Resi come from? Oh, that's a good one, Jimmy. Um, So anyone who has followed me will know that uh, Resi was originally originally called Build Path. And that was very much like a working title name because we had this idea for the business, but we didn't have a name and Jules found the .com and so we just went with it. Um, and then uh, like a year in, uh, I actually, you know, when everyone goes like, what's bit, you know, what failures have you had? And then like, well, mine, I was epic. Cause sometimes I get a bit sort of um, bloody minded. And there was a guy that also had the name Build Path. And he was like, you need to stop using my name. And I was like, no, I don't. Cause you have a trademarked it. Um, and then he went and trademarked it overnight. And so we had to change the name. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jules and I spent, um, a long time trading ideas backwards and forwards. But then I kind of got um, this idea that we weren't like a regular highbrow architecture practice. We were a bit more soft, a bit more cuddly, and I therefore wanted something more colloquial. And the reason we ended up with Resi is one, it was available. It's always key when you're looking for a name. But two, um, uh, you know, when people talk about mortgages, they'll say, oh, is it a commercial or a Resi? Or are you buying a Resi or a commercial property? So I felt like it was quite a nice, soft sort of um slang almost um yeah. indication of what we were doing it also had a very it was very strong it was four letters which meant we could b- build four pillars around like the four pillars of the brand so yeah in the end it just worked and um i do like the fact that people will be like is it Reese?" and i'm just i don't understand that everyone can't just like look at it and be like it's resi <laughs> it's just like surely like that you can't pronounce it any other way but yeah that's the story of the name really and where did the idea come from um the idea very succinctly came from me because um i started to do a side return on my um house in streatham hill and to i won't bore you with the detail but i think a couple of things came out of that experience one is that it was very analog nothing was really done online there was a lot of trips to the architect's office a lot of spreadsheets emails so that's the first thing but the second thing that i found really troublesome and the reason we ended up doing this was that um I what happens at the moment in the kind of construction industry is that the consumer has to accrue an awful lot of quite complex technical knowledge in order to decipher and understand what's going on and make educated mm-hmm. decisions. And given that we only ever do this maybe once or twice, it feels like an, a big ask to put on a consumer. And it's also why that that like that level of frustration and emotion comes into it, because it's a bit like, you know, um, you kind of going into um, a science lab and someone asking you if they were running the right process. Yeah. How do you know? And 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 the only way you know is by learning and then being like, oh yeah. And it's the same in that in the sector. And so I just felt like there had to be a way that we could take a, cus- a consumer on a a better, more simplified journey to that where they didn't have to have all that knowledge to make decisions that would give them the end outcome that they wanted. Yeah. And so what does Resi do? Resi makes your home improvement idea a reality, um, delivering quality um, in a climate friendly way at speed for less. And so talk to us about the customer journey. How does the customer discover you? Um, well, we've got this philosophy at Resi where, um, have you ever done, actually, let me ask you this, Jimmy. No. Have you ever done um, a renovation or extension? No, because the idea <laughs> terrifies me. So as well as terrified you, let's say it didn't terrify you, where would you start? Um, that is a good question. Where would I start? I mean, friends, families, the obvious, and then just Google. Right. 
So essentially, you're not really sure. Yes. Yeah. So I would say 99.9% of all of our customers have no idea, do they need a surveyor? Do they need an architect? Or should they be looking at a builder or going to the bank first? So we, we discovered this pretty early on about six years ago. And so what we believe is if we give knowledge, we build trust. So um, everything we do at Resi is, is basically to educate, give away um, knowledge in bite-sized, understandable English, um, whether that's on our blogs or our videos. Um, and what that does is it fosters some trust with you giving away something for free up front, um, I, which includes um, a half an hour consultation where we will take you through um, with one of our experts what's feasible and you know what's likely according to, to planning. And that's usually the first start of the first part of the journey for a consumer is to have that initial chat and do that initial research. And from there, everything very much moves um, into our digital platform. Um, to help a customer sort of go through that journey. And do you do all this now via sort of phones in terms of sort of cameras and being able to see that? Presumably that's made the journey much more efficient as well. Yeah, I mean, COVID really helped us out because um, we, our number one objection when we first started was like, what do you mean the architect doesn't visit our home? People can kind of get their head around that, you know, you could do this thing remotely. So that's really helped um, from that perspective. And also people are now used to being on Zoom. Uh, yeah. They're used to kind of transacting online. Um, so we very much, um, what typically happens is uh, we've got a lot of proprietary data and we supplement that with publicly available data. So when you phone in, and I know you live in two things, so let's say we're doing your house. Sorry, I won't name, name where you live in case, you know, some <laughs> yeah. ardent fan stalks you. Um, we would have already done the research on your property. So when you, um, when we're on that call with you, we would be telling you, you know, what the precedence of the area is, but then also like how much can you extend out the back or, or up front and what could that look like? And we would have models there to show you in 4D the sorts of things you could expect if you embarked on the journey with us. So what does 4D mean? Um, it's, well, it's, it's basically 3D that you can fly through it. Okay. Does that make sense? Sounds exciting. <laughs> It's a bit like, I mean, we don't do this. We're not like Oculus Rift, but that's essentially what is happening when you put an Oculus on is you're yeah. walking or flying through a room. Well, it's, it's kind of the same with uh, with um, the technology that we have at Resi is that it's not just you can't swirl around it for 3D. You can actually like go inside it and you can turn around in a room and sort of start getting a feel for the space. Because I think when I first started going back to kind of what drove us to do this, one of the things I found very hard was looking at 2D flat floor plans and drawed elevations and being like, do I want to spend 50, 60, 70,000? Like, am I, you know, most people are not visual. Do I want this? Um, and so what we try to do is really bring that to life because I think you, you really have to make a customer fall in love with this idea. Otherwise, they're never going to get through being terrified like yeah. you. Yeah. And you can't, presumably one of the big advantages of it as well is that sometimes you can't, see what you can't see in terms of what's 100%. possible right yeah. and some of the stuff you've taken me through before is like and you can see it on your instagram page as well like it's properly transformational mm. you can't almost see that that could even be possible yeah. right because modern building has come on like leaps and bounds since the turn of the decade absolutely and um you know consumers mainly it's funny that because obviously you've just you've just had your little little girl your second one and that is actually when most people come to us. They come to us at one of the life events. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you know, I'm expecting or you've you've had the child and you don't have enough room or you've got an elderly, aging aunt or, or you know, mother that needs to move in or um, it's, it, oh, someone's died. And, you you know, there's all these different events, but it usually is a life event that will drive someone to do, to do this sort of work. And so they come to you often with right, quite nominal ideas of what they want. They might want to add value to their home or they might want to have more space or they might want to make that home work harder. But that's the objective. They're not sure what they're going to get at the end of it. Does that mean yeah. like from a, from a visual or a spatial perspective? And that's what we really try to help you imagine is what is what is the kind of potential? What's the latent value in this home that you're living in? And can we make it work harder for the phase of life that you're in? And how many customers have you done so far? Uh, I mean, completed projects, I think it's like, so built about 4,700, but we've got 6,000 something in flight. Right. Okay. Yeah. So quite, quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So almost hitting 10,000 soon, which is a big milestone. It will be. I will celebrate that milestone. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think your customers kind of most benefit from? I mean... You know, most companies will say that we are quicker, we're faster, you know, all the kind of normal, usual selling points. And so this one sounds a bit lame when I say it this way, but 
essentially like we've we've done extensive customer research on the people who have gone with us and not gone with us and what of the overwhelmingly people are looking for is someone to guide them along the process so that's what we over index on we over index on being that kind of like signposting what you need to think about now and what is irrelevant you know a lot it's so funny you'll get you if you ever get like a couple on a call the man will be one of two things it'll be like what can I legally do and how much is it going to cost? Very like, like transactional, like give me the numbers. And the woman, sorry, it's a stereotype, will not often be like, well, you know, I really want an Arga in the kitchen over there. I want an island or a base seat or something. And you're just like, there's so many more hoops you need to get through before you even start thinking about that sort of stuff. So our biggest job is to put people, people's minds in the right phase. Um, and we do that through all of the advice that we give, but also by the signposting that you get on the platform, because it very much is like a an all-in-one solution that you're, you know, you're on the platform and everything is in there that you need from ideation right through to completion of of the project. Alex, since you've come on the show, one of the things that I know has kind of gone up in Resi's priorities is the kind of environmental green aspect of things. And it's also gone up in everyone else's agendas. Yeah, we've just seen the hottest day uh, that the UK's ever had. Uh, Everyone's desperately trying to keep their houses and homes cool and we're just not used to it like the Mediterranean. How are you helping people combat that? Two words, ventilation and um, continuous insulation. I find it really interesting, as I always do, uh, uh, the way that the government and you and the kind of public discourse is about this stuff. And so you read any blog and it'll say to you, how do you improve the performance of your home? And they'll be like, put some roof insulation in or put an air salt, uh, you know, a, a green energy source. And actually, that's only half the story. And in fact, actually, if you just went out tomorrow and put some loft insulation down, you probably wouldn't feel any effect in your home. And that's because unless the envelope, so think roof, walls, floors, that's the envelope of your house, unless that is sealed and then you put good ventilation in so you don't get, you over moisturize your house, you, you're you basically throwing money down the drain. So that's why you see all these people that are like, well, I put an air source heat pump in and my bills aren't come down. And you're like, well, that's that's because you you home, you might have roof insulation, but it's not linked up to your wall cavity insulation. Um, and actually there's some really, really simple things that you can do, like some tape, tape that you can do, you can use, um, a different way of dotting and dabbing your plasterboard without getting too technical. None of this costs any more money. And I think the reason that Resi feels that we're a platform to do this is because most people um, don't kind of go, oh, I tell you what, I'm going to put some roof insulation in unless things are like really bad. But actually, if you've already made the decision that you want to improve your home and get it to work better for you from a spatial perspective, it's not too much of a stretch to be like, well, actually, while we're in there and causing all this, you know, disruption, let's do a couple of other things to really help you move that from an E to a C or a, a D to a B. Um, and it doesn't cost that much more money when you're already in there. So we feel like we're already going into 150 homes a month. So why not make this um, like kind of that like that second tier benefit, if you like, and then overall, like you should with a much better product. So that's what we've kind of been doing over the last sort of six months is really trying to help customers um, really maximize that disruption and bring as much benefit to their lives as possible. And talk to us a bit about the fundraising that you undertook for it. And of course, you've an uh, exited entrepreneur before in terms of the cleaning company, Hassle and so on. And we've been on clubhouses together. And I've always been struck that you are very good at giving advice. There are lots of aspiring entrepreneurs that listen to this show. And the way you talk about the kind of six week campaign that you need to think about and so on has always stuck with me. So I'd love to hear that again. <laughs> I mean, the thing with... um so the thing with fundraising is like it's really a game of of of, um, of knowledge, right? So um, it's like how much uh, how much knowledge there is about your company in the market versus how much there isn't, um, and you know you you have to sort of drive competition. So you have to create it even when it doesn't exist. And so the way that we've always done that is to run a very very tight um, fundraise, which looks a bit like this. You kind of carve out the, the market, whether it's an angel market or a venture market or a private equity market, like wherever it is you're, you're raising money and you bucket people into three buckets. Um, the kind of tier twos that you're a bit naff, but you take the money if there's nothing else available. You're, um, you're bigger guys. So they're kind of like the guys that are the next level up. So you're probably too small for, but it's very much a marketing campaign and they get you ready for the next round. But they also talk about you, which is really key. And then the third guys, which are like your, your sweet spot, they're, they're the guys that you believe 
understand your thesis and your market, you, you know, they're, they're lending at the right level and you've got your best chance with. And the reason you structure it that way is you can kind of afford to make a mistake on that first group because, you know, you, you're not you, you're not going to be that pitch ready. You'll also get some really interesting feedback that you can then take forward into the next ones. Um, and if you get a term sheet from them, brilliant, because that that, that in, introduces competitive tension. The, the second, uh, they're going to be the people that talk about you because they all talk, right? Yeah, That's yeah. The one thing you need to know. Um, and then by the time you hit your sort of weeks four and five of this six week campaign, um, you are pitch perfect. You know all the answers to every question someone's going to ask you. You hopefully have got a couple of term sheets. The market's talking about you, and it and it and the thing is, you have to realize, like, and I mean this with the greatest respect, because I have a lot of venture capitalists that are my friends, but they really are sheep. I mean, it's just like human beings, right? We're all if we think we're missing out on something, you know, we're going to queue up outside Selfridges to be the first to get the new bag, or outside the Apple Store to be, you know, the first to get the new iPhone release. It's like venture; like if they think they're going to miss out on a deal, they'll start fighting each other, and that's how you drive the valuation up. You get more money. I mean, none of this applied right now, though, Jimmy. You do understand, given the market that we're in. I think the advice I'd give to anyone fundraising is you need to eke out your, your runway to eighteen to twenty-four months. Um, because I think VCs can afford to not deploy much capital over a year horizon, but after that they start they start peeing off LPs and losing talent. So I think it's going to be summer next summer before we see any any cash really being doled out. Yeah, yeah, summer twenty twenty three before uh, for people listening long time into the future, yeah. etc. I mean, there has been on that. So that I mean, that's the private markets that we're talking about. There's been speculation from Mark Clymer at Sky News that you'll look to IPO. The world has changed again <laughs> since that, right? What are your kind of latest thoughts on the next stages of where Resi goes? Uh, oh my god! I mean, like from a kind of like exit fundraise perspective. Um, we've always tried to, um, unlike a lot of um, tech companies, we've actually always tried to skirt that line of profitability versus investment because uh, I, there's nothing worse than having no optionality. And if you're if you're close to pr profitability, you're always um, it's and it always we're always within reach. You're a lot safer. And so we've always kind of played that game. And so for us right now, you know, the IPM IPO markets are effectively closed. Um, I'm not sure when they'll reopen. And so what we're focusing down on is two things is runway preservation. And then the second thing is um, given the tailwinds in um, the kind of uh, sort of broader um, kind of the macro um, tailwinds of um, energy efficiency. So people's energy bills going uh, berserk. And then also, um, you know, the government's thrust into kind of net zero. Um there are 90 million homes in the UK that don't reach the standard EPCC certificate or above. And so I think that in the next 10 years, there's going to be a real push to making our homes better ventilated and better insulated. So at Resi, as well as looking at runway, what we're trying to do is um, for every person that comes through, make sure that they don't just go away with a space that they love that suits their needs, but actually we work on making that space more energy efficient and um generally costing them less to live in. So that's kind of our thrust for the next two years. And we're just going to have to wait and see what happens on a, on a broader horizon to see like where where the exit is or, or the strategic hookup is because it's just, yeah, it's it's uh, like the Wild West at the minute. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's crazy out there. Um, and talk to us about the sort of qualities that you believe that an entrepreneur entrepreneur needs because i know you spend a lot of time helping other kind of female entrepreneurs as well mm. how what are the kind of like skills that, that you're looking for in in other entrepreneurs but also when hiring what are the key attributes so i think um i think the two key attributes for um an entrepreneur uh, quite simply um bags full of naivety um yeah. because if you're not naive you would never do this um, I think once you once the cobwebs have been wiped off your eyes, you're like, oh my god! But by that point, you're in it, and you can put, you're probably unemployable. And the second thing is, you need the ability to think big and be able to to to, to piece themes that are emerging together to see where the opportunities are. Um, but you can't have one without the other, if that makes sense. They they both need to come into play at once. And then, like when I'm trying to hire, like it's it's especially now, like when the when the employment market is so so tight. I used to joke that. It was really hard to find um, 
you know, the right people with the right experience and skill set. And now I just joke that you can't find bodies. Like, it's just like, there's just like a, a dire lack of people. And I think it's interesting that the newspapers pick up a lot on um, the lack of construction workers, the lack of hospitality, the lack of retail. But like, it's not just there. Like, you know, in, in the kind of industry that I work in, in the kind of more technical space, whether it's data or data scientists, engineers, marketeers, sales, there's just no one. We've been hiring for entry-level BDs, entry-level business development um, analysts for like six months. And you just, there's just no one. I don't know where all the people have gone, but they're just not there. So what, what, what yeah, what does a business analyst do? Because that sounds quite an interesting, appealing job. What, so so what my, oh, sorry, what my business development guys do, uh, business development consultants, sorry, is they're the guys that we train up in um, planning law and, and sort of basic development law, who will be the first point of contact that you speak to about your project. Um, and so, you know, typically we've always like looked to estate agencies or, uh, you know, people who have played sport because yeah. they tend to be uh, really good at the job. But now it's like, I'm just like, anywhere, anyone who shows any level of kind of hungriness and, and has got some sort of like aptitude for winning or, you know, not being defeated by problems. Yeah, we'll take anyone. And I think that's where it's got to now. And, and that's what we've always looked for in hiring is that like, it's lovely to get experience. That is a, it's a lovely thing to have if you can get it. Um, and, you know, definitely at the senior levels, you absolutely need it. But now at the kind of, you know, sort of entry level and a few levels up, we're just going for anyone from any industry that is clearly bright and hungry to get on because, um, yeah, it's that tight. And you talk about, entrepreneurs needing naivety and the ability to dream big where does resilience come into it as well i mean i think it's your kind of num it's your key it's your number one key characteristic because um you know if if i i like to think of myself as being um quite tough <laughs> i think most people who've met me will probably say i'm quite tough and i you know the last two and a half years have really tested my ability to keep going um, because it's just been knock after knock after knock. You know, if it wasn't COVID, it was the opening and shutting of the economy with COVID. And then coming out of COVID, you know, you know, and we could see inflation coming because, um, you know, timber was trading at 100% yeah. up. I had, I had, I had builders like trading plaster, like it was crack cocaine in car parks, right? That's how, like, that's how, uh, how, how, um, uh, tight the, 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 materials market was um so we knew that that was coming i didn't know it was going to come so aggressively because no one could have predicted a war in europe um and so it just seems to be like one thing after another you know like this next election what's that the third in six years yeah. it's just we f it feels like we're living in really like fragile or tumultuous times and so um it is really hard sometimes to like pick yourself up and i've actually asked myself numerous times like you know why am i doing this because um, sometimes it feels like there could be an easier way to sort of like earn a living and, and have yeah. a better balance. So I think resilience is sort of what everyone across the nation is depleted in. Do you think we've almost become immune to sort of macroeconomic shocks and, and not making it almost an, an impact on things? You know, we, there's been so many in the last six or seven mm. years and it just, you know, it, it, yeah, we're still at record high levels of employment and talent's really difficult. I mean, it feels a very odd time. It, no, I mean it, it does, and 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 the thing is, I think if the if it doesn't start loosening up, then it's going to start defying economic theory, right? Because economic theory yeah. states that like you know there's a relationship between employment and inflation, and if that breaks down, I think we're going to be in unknown territory completely, a bit like where we were with COVID. Um, but in terms of like, you know, I've, has everyone become immune to it? I, I, I genuinely, when I talk to some of my staff, like they have no idea. I, I think unless you're sort of you know, in a leadership position or you, you're you interested in it or your job necessitates it, I actually think people switch off to everything. I think no one really knows that there's a leadership election going on. Or maybe they know, but they really don't care. Mm -hmm. Everyone's kind of aware of inflation and they're definitely talking about, you know, the price of fuel going up at the pumps. But I don't think they pay, I don't think anyone's piecing any of this together. I think they're all just sort of in their lane trying to do the best that they can. And what would your advice be to, you know, there will be a new government formed under a new prime minister in the next month or so on. You've previously run the um, campaign group for digital startups called Kodak. So you've been very kind of involved in that that world. What would your kind of advice be to the incoming government? Um, I think they need to reset their relationship with business because I think it's at an all time low. Um, I, I you know, I've I've been around since sort of 2010 and, and the governments that have gone through there and this over the last, you know, 
under your tenure <laughs> at number 10, sorry. And then subsequent, I've never felt so, you know, that, that, that you don't have a voice. I think it's getting, it's getting, we're definitely seeing more engagement, but you know, it, it, the government has to reach out beyond the likes of the CBI. I don't, I, the CBI do a great job. Don't, I, I'm not, um, discounting or discrediting them but they'd certainly don't speak for a company like mine and so i think there has to be more people around the table and i think it has to be a partnership between government i think ollie barrett the post that you mentioned yes. i thought it was a brilliant post i mean i'm i'm a member of that task force for liz truss and i think yeah so just let's just explain that for a second so liz you're on liz truss's task force for fast growth female enterprises right yeah and i'm also helping rachel reeves and a small group of people write a very similar paper about startup and scale-ups and whether they've got the right support and that's for so men the, and that's the labor shadow chancellor for anyone that doesn't know the yeah, cabinet exactly. inside, inside out uh, Alex. Why, why are these people why are these people ask me have no idea but anyway um so they're both looking at the same thing and i think it's a really interesting question because there is um a gap i think in funding which is you know, we we sort of have this notion that high growth businesses are businesses that grow above 20% year on year. But that is not what a VC looks for. A VC is looking, a venture capitalist is looking for businesses that are growing 100 to 150% year on year, typically. I mean, now is a bit different. Yeah. Um, and private equity will look at businesses going 20%, but you've got to be at 10 million revs 20 million revs to be considered so there is a gap in the market where you're you're maybe you know your revenue is sub 10 million you're growing i don't know 20 60 percent year on year you're not going to be in a, a vc sweet spot or a pe sweet spot so where do you get funding and it, it, it's the it's a notion series b you know like yeah. people talk about um and women are typically more predisposed to running those sorts of businesses than they are the the that so like how are we going to fund those businesses because they have to get through that 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 gulf between start up and scale up and how do we get them there and i think that's essentially what uh, liz trust wants to look at and it's essentially what rachel weaves is looking at and so it's it's i think it's intellectually very interesting for me but i think we either need to look at adapting the current financial instruments or recreate one a la Elon Musk out of first principles and see if it's possible. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, yeah. Why not dream big, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> to, your, to your point earlier. Um, so one of the questions that we uh, ask entrepreneurs is to kind of pass the mic. Which female entrepreneurs out there at the moment are you seeing that are thinking big and got big ideas? Oh, God, there's, there's so many of them. Um and the sort and what what is really um you know warm warms my heart is is how many more there is now than there's been for well since we started. Although I do we still we still see the press reaching out to the same sort of five or six people. But so the two girls up in I think they're in Manchester, Laura Pomfret and Holly Hol Holly Holland. Great name. Um and I love these girls. I first came across them in um like TikTok ran a competition that I judged and they're giving um, financial advice to women. So like the kind of TikTok generation getting them, you know, smarter about stocks and shares, ISAs, pensions, like things that I didn't really like even think about until I was sort of in my like mid thirties. And I think that's, that's, they're doing a real kind of public good in that. So they'd, they'd be one off the top of my head, but yeah, the, the, as I, I was saying to you before we came on air, I, I think there's loads of like biomedical and like kind of health um, and B2B businesses in the UK. We just don't celebrate them because we don't understand them. So they just kind of fly under the radar. Yeah. Um, and it's a real shame actually. We should, we should endeavor to collect a list of them because I think we've learned probably a lot from their successes. I agree. And like, if you were 22 in 2022, mm. what sector do you think you'd be looking to kind of explore? Where's kind of the most exciting? Would it be something in the life sciences, biotech space? I think climate change is is such a big problem. I think that's where I would, I probably wouldn't stay to, stray too far out of my lane. I think there are some really, really exciting um businesses that are you know kind of looking at whole life carbon and pulling it out of you know new types of concrete and new building materials um and things and like you know there's a great company up in manchester is it sealed or is that the us one i forget the name but they basically 
um, pump this substance into your pipes through your house or your office to find out where they're leaking to basically close them up. So I think wow. air tightness is a big thing that we're looking at. So I think that's where, if I was 22 years old, that's where I, I would be looking. But it's unfortunate because we have to get the, the financiers backing that type of stuff. Hardware is notoriously difficult to raise money for because it's lots and lots of R&D. It's the same with like laboratories and yeah. you know testing of new drugs. Drugs is the same thing. So you know, it, I, I know I'm a kind of consumer tech person, but really there's been far too much money that's that's gone into consumer tech and B2B SaaS that probably we need to re-divert into some of these more hardcore okay. problems. Uh, is there a, I mean, you've been on the show before, so we've asked you about your kind of favorite books and so on, but is there a piece of content, podcasts, something that's stuck with you lately that you think has been particularly powerful? I, I try to read quite a lot. Like I'm a huge Economist fan. So I'd just be like the economist every week. Um, but I think one of the books I read recently that le left a la lasting impression on me and that actually made me change some of my habits was uh, Johan Haar has written a second or third book called Stolen Focus, like why we can't pay attention. And I think he's essentially summing up all of the stuff we really we already know about social media and the internet and, and the kind of transition we've gone through in the sort of last 20 years from, you know, V VH VHS recordings and um, CD CD players to basically having everything in the palm of our hand on our phone. Oh, yeah. yeah, so I, I definitely think give that an audio listen or a book read. Um, and finally, is there a, a quote uh, that you sort of live by that's almost a piece of advice? Um, one of the one of the quotes I do love is the Navy SEALs quote that is um, uh, "Slow is smooth and smooth is fast." Um, and I think sometimes I definitely too prone to sort of jumping in with two feet without thinking things through. And then you, you, you're going really fast, but nothing's smooth. And therefore it actually and, and ultimately slows you down in the end. Alex, thanks so much for coming back on Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Oh, Jimmy, thanks for having me back again. I always love chatting to you. We do it in the person this time as well. It's so exciting. This show is made possible by the fantastic support of our various partners. And I wanted to thank the Octopus Group. The Octopus Group is a collection of eight entrepreneurially minded businesses across financial services and energy, all founded on the one simple belief that people and the planet deserve better. They are intent on building a better tomorrow for future generations and are a certified B Corp, demonstrating they care as much about the impact of their investments as the returns they generate. I am proud that Octopus have backed this show since the second series, and they are the reason why we are now able to put such a professional show together. To hear more about what they do, it is worth checking out previous episodes with the founders Chris Hewlett and Simon Rogerson, or the CEO of their investments arm, Ruth Hancock. If you want to see how you could partner with us, go to our website at www.jobsofthefuture.co. And now, on to today's episode. 